We're going to be in Isaiah 53 as we continue on uh, in the series we've been doing called Against All Odds. But uh, before we start, can we just stand together and pray? Go to the Father. Lord, we come before you on this Good Friday. Good from our perspective, at least. Just to say thank you. Oh God, our, our minds cannot fathom and our hearts can scarcely comprehend what you did for us on that day so many years ago. And so we just stand in your presence with our heads and our hearts bowed low, humbly before you and just, Lord, attempt to, as best we can, here on this side of heaven, to just say, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Lord, as we remember the words that your son spoke to those sad sisters there at the tomb of their brother when you said, I am the resurrection and the life. Lord, we thank you that we have context that they did not have in that moment to understand the significance of that. And I pray that tonight as we approach this next phase and aspect of our worship that, Lord, we would approach it seriously with all intention of honoring you with every single syllable of it. May your word speak boldly to our hearts. And Lord, if it confronts us or confounds us, Lord, I pray that we would be open to letting you do the work you need to do in us. We ask and we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. There's a story that's been going around in my family um, for quite some time. And as far as I know, the majority of what I'm going to tell you tonight is true. But um, I I, I do just want to preface... That, that I was so young, I don't remember this personally. Um, I was there for it, but, but I, don't, I don't remember it actually happening. I've only heard stories of it. And how many of y'all got a story that goes around in your family every now and then? And that story can change, right? Like, it, it, it gets a little bigger, or the characters change, or the details of it can change a little bit. So I'm just going to repeat it to you as best I know. And, and the point that I'm trying to make will be made um, even if I get the details a, a little wrong. So I grew up um, in, a, in a family of four boys. My mom and dad are still married after all of these years, and my, uh, my aunt and Uncle Jesse uh, are as well. So really, I grew up, to understand this, you have to understand, I grew up in a family of seven boys, because I had, I had three cousins. I have many more than three cousins. But, but I had three cousins that I spent... For the first 18 years of my life, I spent almost every day with these other three boys, right? There were seven of us in total. And we started going out to the ranch with our fathers when we were really young, but kind of the, the threshold to get to go was you had to be potty trained. And on this particular occasion, for whatever reason, my mom needed us to go with dad, but it was a bit too early for one of us. And we were out at the ranch and had been out there for some time when one of us, it may have been me, I I, I don't even know, I don't remember this. Um, It was either me or my, the next brother who's right behind me, uh, made a mess in our pants. Maybe it was a diaper, maybe we were in that stage where we were kind of potty trained but just not quite good enough, I don't know. But my dad had to deal with it. (laughs) Now, if y'all know my dad, you know a couple of things about this. Number one, he didn't want to deal with it. And number two, he did not know how to deal with it. To this day, I don't think my dad has ever changed a diaper in his entire life. So as the story goes, uh, my father and my uncle stripped the child down, whoever it was, and sprayed them off with a water hose. Now, let's face it, 
When a dirty diaper is involved, you got to do something with it, right? How many of y'all have had kids? How many of you changed a dirty diaper? You got to do something with it. You can't just leave it there. Now, I'm going to face the music here. I'm going to let y'all know <laughs> that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> because I, I can remember a time, and I, I was there for this one. Um, I can remember a time when Abby, for whatever reason, decided to leave me alone <laughs> with one of those infant creatures. And I thought, you know, I can do this. I had changed a couple of diapers. I knew how to feed it. I knew how to burp it. I knew how to comfort it. And I thought, you know, I I got this. But it was just a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes after Abby left, when that, that little creature looked at me. And it was one of those moments where you just thought... Man, this is precious because he he just smiled like. <laughs> and and as I reflect on it now and I back up, it was kind of that smile that I feel like the devil gives you when he's about to get you. You know, it's more of a smirk than a smile. It's kind of like I fix and do something. And about the time I was embracing this beautiful moment, I smelled it. (laughs) I did what all dads probably do, or most dads do. I tried to ignore it. Because normally mom's around, and if you ignore it long enough, mom's going to deal with it. But mom wasn't there. So I started praying. (laughs) Lord, send her home. Maybe she forgot something and she had to come back. Whatever, Lord, she need, mom needs to be back. Like, you need to get mom back here. And the Lord did not answer my prayers. <laughs> and true story, I, I knew this story that had happened in my family earlier and I thought, you know, there is a water hose in the backyard. <laughs> but we lived in town, not out on the ranch. And so I thought, you know, if I get that water hose involved... CPS is probably going to show up. We don't, we don't need that to happen. And so I had to go in there and deal with it. And I still have nightmares about it to this very day. But what I'm trying to tell you is when there's a dirty diaper involved, you got to do something with it, right? Right? Now, y'all are probably sitting here going, what does this have to do with Jesus? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. But it does have something to do with my big idea for today, which is this. You got to do something with Jesus. You just do. You got to do something with him. Now, I've titled this message, The Jesus Problem. And can I just tell you, I don't have a problem with Jesus. You probably don't have a problem with Jesus. You're here on Friday night for the Good Friday service, other places you could have been. We don't have collectively a problem with Jesus, but most people do. And you gotta do something with Jesus. You can't just ignore Jesus. You can't pretend like he's not there. He's not going away, y'all. And it's as uncomfortable and as difficult as it might be, you got to do something with Jesus. This is the same problem people in Jesus' day faced. They had to do something with him. Now, they didn't do the right things with him, but they had to do something with him. And this is what Isaiah is getting at as we pick up where we left off last week in verse 3 of Isaiah 53. This is what he's foreshadowing and foretelling, how people are going to deal with Jesus. It says, he was despised and rejected by men. You got to do something with him. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. It predicts how the Son of God would be treated in some 
very broad and general ways, the broadest and most general terms you can say it, right? He's despised, he's rejected, he's turned away from, he's not valued. But this is what people did with Jesus or were going to do with Jesus. And what I want us to do today is take a look at this text in light of what most people did with the Jesus problem then and what most people are doing with the Jesus problem now. Because sadly, what most people did with Jesus then is what they're still doing with Jesus today. Not much has changed. Jesus is not going away, so you gotta do something with Jesus. Due to the number of points I have, we're not gonna spend a lot of time in any one of them. In fact, we're gonna fly pretty quick. I'm not gonna give you multiple verses. We're not gonna dig in deep. But I'm gonna give you the top six things people do with Jesus. The top six things people did with Jesus. And then we will end today with the only one proper thing you should do with Jesus. Number one, they disliked him. They disliked Jesus. Now, not everyone disliked Jesus, but many people disliked Jesus. You know, when it comes to a dirty diaper, there's plenty of reasons not to like it. There's plenty of reasons to dislike it. I mean, I get that. But why would anybody dislike Jesus? Well, they had their reasons, and again, for the sake of time, we're not going to dive into all of their reasons today. We're not going to get around to all of that. But I want you to know they did dislike him very much. In fact, Jesus uses the word hated. In John 15, 18, Jesus, these are, this is Jesus, red letters here, he says this, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus was aware of their hatred for him. He was aware that people disliked him. And he continues, if you jump down, if you're there in John 15, if you jump down to verse 23, it says this, the one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. He says they've seen, they've seen the miracles, they've heard the sermons, they know who I am, and yet they still hate me and my father. Verse 25, but this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled, they hated me for no reason. They hated him for no reason. The only thing worse than being disliked or being hated is to be disliked or hated for no reason at all. And that's what they did with Jesus. And many people still today don't like Jesus. They dislike Jesus or hate Jesus, not because they have a reason to, not because he's ever done anything to them, not not because there's a reason to hate Jesus, they just hate him. I mean, you gotta do something with Jesus and Many people choose to just dislike him. The second thing people did with Jesus and still do to this day is this. They dismissed him. They didn't just dislike him. Some people said, you know, he's, he's likable enough, but we're just going to dismiss him. We're going to ignore him. We're going to pretend like he's not there. Or we're just going to pretend like he does not matter. He's not important. He's insignificant. Plenty of examples of this in scripture, but I'll, for the sake of time, just give you two. First, look with me in John chapter one, verse 46. This is really early on in Jesus' ministry. He's not very well known. Jesus has just called Philip to come and be one of his disciples, and Philip goes and does what any good friend should do. He goes and tells his uh, buddy, Nathaniel, about Jesus. He says, you gotta come see this guy. You gotta come meet this guy, Nathaniel. Come on, man, come, come with me and see what I found. But Nathaniel dismisses Jesus, not based on anything Jesus had done, not based on knowing Jesus at all. No, Nathaniel simply dismisses Jesus because of where he came from. Can anything good, John 1, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Nathaniel just wants to dismiss it because his hometown is Nazareth. 
Nathanael would go and see, and he would ultimately become one of the twelve. But his first instinct was to do with Jesus what many others have done throughout the centuries, just to dismiss him. Even the people of Jesus' hometown dismissed him. In Mark chapter 6, we see the account of this, starting in verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown among his relatives and his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. Jesus was amazed here, but for all the wrong reasons. He was amazed at their unbelief. They just totally dismissed him. They said, this can't be the kid we know. I mean, isn't this the carpenter, Joseph's son? I mean, he's from Nazareth. He's from here. We know this guy. Can't be him. They just dismissed it. And this happens in different ways at different times all throughout his ministry. People just dismiss him. This is the answer many choose still today when it comes to Jesus. When they're faced with the Jesus problem, they just dismiss it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to pray about it. They don't want to investigate it. They don't want to dive into it because they're afraid of what might happen. The problem is you've got to do something with Jesus. The third thing people did and still do is this. They distrusted him. They distrusted him. They, they didn't trust the guy. As you read the Gospels, this is easy to see, particularly in light of the religious leaders of the day. They didn't trust Jesus at all. It's very apparent that the people in power didn't trust Jesus. That's, that's surface stuff. That's easy stuff to see. But if you really dive into this point and you really want to drive it home, the reality is a reality that we don't really want to face, and that is this. Many people who followed Jesus didn't trust Jesus. It's possible to follow Jesus and not trust him. I mean, they liked Jesus, but when the rubber meets the road and it's time to really trust Jesus, most of them couldn't do it. One of the greatest examples of this, again, for the sake of time, John 6. These are his followers, his disciples. And look at this with me in verse 60 of John 6. Therefore, when many of his, his disciples... Not others' disciples, not, not people that are on the fringes, not, not, hey, the first day at church kind of people. These are his disciples. They've been following him. When they heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Because the rubber met the road and it was time to trust Jesus. Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he asked them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life, but there are some among you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless he is granted to him by my Father. From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the twelve, the inner circle of his disciples, you don't want to go away too, do you? See, you can like Jesus and not trust him, and that's what a lot of people chose to do with Jesus. I'll give you some more just kind of practical examples quickly from Scripture. You know, Peter trusted Jesus enough to get out of the boat, but he didn't trust Jesus enough to walk on the water, did he? Because as he got out there, he began to focus on the storm and the waves and all the other stuff, and what happened? He began to sink, and Jesus had to save him. Peter, he, he trusted Jesus enough to draw his sword in the garden and go to blows, man. He, he took out a guy's, he went for the head, man. He was like serious. He wasn't like just going to poke him and warn him. He was like, I'm going to kill this dude. 
chops off an ear. That's all he got. Jesus put it back on. It's pretty cool. But Peter, he trusted Jesus enough to draw that sword in the garden, but he didn't trust Jesus enough to keep his mouth shut in the courtyard. You got to do something with Jesus. And it's not any different for us today. I mean, a lot of people trust Jesus enough to get them into heaven, so they say, but they don't trust him enough to get into the baptistry and get baptized. Where the rubber meets the road and a public confession is required. They say they trust Jesus enough to get them into heaven, but they don't trust him enough to come to church because they might get sick. They say they trust Jesus enough for their their blessings and their wants and their desires and they're counting on him to come through, but boy, they're not gonna trust him with their tithe or their generosity. They say they trust Jesus enough to forgive them of every sin they've ever committed and yet they can't trust him enough to turn the other cheek or forgive somebody who sinned against them. They trust Jesus with their unspeakable trials. When their back's against the wall and there's nowhere else to go and there's no one else to trust, well, they'll trust him. But they can't seem to trust him with their unspoken addictions that they hide inside of their self that no one else knows about. They're not giving that up. I'm not trying to meddle here. I'm just trying to make the point you got to do something with Jesus. And you can't say you trust him, but then not trust him. You can say you like him and not trust him, but a lot of people just distrusted Jesus, even his own disciples, even people who followed him. And it's still that way today. When Isaiah said he was despised and we didn't value him, that's true of us too. It's just as relevant for us today as it was then. Because many people who say they follow Jesus don't really actually trust Jesus. They distrust him. You got to do something with him. And I guess distrusting him is an option. It's one many people choose. The next one's even worse than distrusting him, but a lot of people do this one still today. A lot of them did it then too. Number four, they disobeyed him. Again, I see no need to linger here. The point is very obvious in the scriptures. It's equally obvious in our day and time. When it comes to Jesus, many people just flat out disobey him. I mean, you got to do something with him. And a lot of people just say, well, I'll disobey him. I'll just disobey him all together, all in, all out. I'm just not going to do anything the guy tells me to do, or I'll do the things I want to do that he says I should do, but I'm not going to do the things I don't want to do that he says I should do. That's disobedience. Look at what Jesus said in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you're going to listen to me. If you love me, you're going to obey me. If you love me, you're going to do your best to follow me. If you trust me and love me, you're going to obey me. Look at Luke 11, 27 through 28. As he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd, she raised her voice and she said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. Oh, doesn't that sound spiritual? Sounds real eloquent. I bet she worked on that. Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. I mean, if, if somebody said that to me, that'd puff me up a little bit. That'd make, that'd make me feel pretty good. But look what Jesus says. He says, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those who obey me. Maybe John sums it up the best when he said this in 1 John 2, 3 through 6. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, 
the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Should obey him. He should walk just as he walked. You got to do something with Jesus. You can obey him or you can disobey him, but you got to do something with him. You can't ignore him. Others took a completely different approach. They didn't only disobey him, they dishonored him. They dishonored him, and many still do it today. Of course, we see this in the trials of Christ as they dress him up as a king and as they pretend to worship him. We see it as they dishonor him by spitting on him. As they dishonor him by crushing a crown of thorns into his head. We see this evidence all throughout his ministry too where they dishonored him. Look at John 8, 48, for example. The Jews responded to him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? I do not have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father and you, he calls them out flat out on it. He says, you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There's no one who seeks it and judges. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. I don't know what would have been more dishonoring to Jesus to accuse Jesus of having a demon or to call him a Samaritan. Both were insults to him. Both were dishonoring in that culture. But it's the kind of stuff that followed Jesus everywhere he went because you can't ignore him. You've got to do something with him. And a lot of people just said, we'll dishonor him and try to discredit him and ultimately destroy him. But no matter what they did, no matter what their words were, no matter what the accusation was, it just never would stick because he's the sinless, sinless lamb of God. So ultimately, you know what they decided to do with Jesus? They discarded him. Pilate, he gets a real bad rap with this part of the story. He gets a a bad rap for being the one who killed Jesus. But you know, Pilate was kind of like my dad out on the ranch that day. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to handle it. Jesus wasn't his problem. But now all of a sudden it was and he had to deal with it. He didn't want to have to deal with the Jesus problem. He, 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 didn't, he didn't really want this responsibility. This wasn't really his job. It's not really his business. But you got to do something with Jesus. I mean, that's where Pilate is in this story, in this position. He had to do something. And look with me at Luke 23, 20 through 23. I mean, he's in a tough spot, a bad spot. It even says in verse 20, wanting to release Jesus. He knew there was, he knew Jesus wasn't who these people said he was. He knew Jesus wasn't guilty and deserving of crucifixion. It says, wanting to release Jesus, Pilate addressed them again. I mean, this is like another attempt to do the right thing on Pilate's part. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And the third time he said to them, why, what has this man done wrong? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him whipped and then release him. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And their voices won out. The scripture says, and their voices one out because you know what if you're Pilate you got to do something with Jesus so he turned him over and they took him up on that hill just outside the city walls and they killed him tacked him to a cross humiliated him the whole way discrediting him and dishonoring him through the whole ordeal But in the end, you got to do something with him. 
So they killed him. There's one more group of people, and there is one more option. And this is the only one that really makes sense in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for all of us. And that is you can discover him. Jesus said something very important in Matthew chapter 7. He said in verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Few discover it, but some will. The gate and the path are narrow and only a few are going to discover it, but praise God, some do. Because they are the ones who see Jesus for who he really is and what he's really done. They are the ones who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Praise God, some find it. We see some in the Bible find it. I mean, this isn't exclusive to our day and time. Some in the Bible were given these eyes and given these ears and given this heart to accept who Jesus really was and believe in. I won't give you a long list, but, you know, let's talk about the thief on the cross. Boy, he discovered it just in the nick of time. He's hanging next to Jesus He's dying next to Jesus. He's not coming off the cross. He's not living another day. This is it. It's over for him too. And in Luke 23, 42, it says this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, praise God, he found it. The centurion figured it out. He found it. Now, Jesus was already dead. But praise God, his eyes were opened. It says this in Matthew 27, 54. Again, Jesus has expired by this point. But when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus, they saw the earthquake, that's what convinced them. And the things that had happened, they were terrified and they said, truly, this man was the son of God. They had to do something with Jesus. Just like everybody else, they had been the ones to tack him to the cross and watch him die there on it. And then when they saw the earthquake and all the other things that were happening around this death, they said, you know what? I might have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. There's something different about this cat. That dude was the son of God. Only a few discover it and only a few find it, but praise God, some do. There's even a man who was a member of the Sanhedrin who discovered it and found it. The Bible says he was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew 27, 57 says this about what happened after Jesus died on the cross. When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, and Matthew says, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus, a member of the Sanhedrin, the ones who had got the whole thing going, the ones who had created the mob, the ones who had wanted him dead. But this guy, he's one of the few, but he found it, he discovered it. Luke added some more context to this part of the story. In Luke 23, we find his version, verse 50. Luke says, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed with their plan. This wasn't something he discovered later. He knew this was wrong from the start, but he was just one voice in a group of many and didn't have the power to stop it. But look at the end of that. It says, and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He had eyes to see and ears to hear. He discovered it. I hope you can see what I'm saying. You gotta do something with Jesus. You can't go through your whole life and not do anything with him. (laughs) He's too big to not do anything with. It's too obvious to not do anything with. You just got to decide what you're going to do with him. What are you going to do with Jesus? I mean, what are you going to do on this Good Friday with Jesus? You can dislike him. You can dismiss him. You can distrust him. You can disobey him. You can dishonor him. 
You can discard him or you can discover him and follow him and obey him and love him and be changed by him forever. But you've got to do something with him. Let's pray. If you are here today and have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you are listening or watching right now and desire to do that very thing, we invite you to pray with us. Maybe you're one of the ones who in the past have done one of these other things, disliked him or dismissed him or distrusted him or disobeyed him. Maybe you've spent your whole life or much of it dishonoring him. Maybe you've just discarded him. But today the Lord has given you eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand that he indeed is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And you have discovered him and the way to life. If that's you, we invite you to pray with us. Prayer of repentance and salvation. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner, that I've messed things up and that I've gone astray. And so I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. I ask by faith that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. I thank you for your love, your grace, your peace, your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins so that I could live. Lord, as we prepare to close and ultimately in a moment come to your table and take the Lord's Supper together as the family of God, we see this reality all around us, people doing different things with you. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's not all that people do. Father, so many do the wrong things when they're confronted with you. And so we pray for those. We pray for their hearts, for their minds, for their lives, but Lord, ultimately for their salvation. Lord, even if it's like the thief on the cross that just in the nick of time they would discover you, we pray they would. Father, we thank you for those who've called on you this day. We ask a blessing on these who have gathered here to worship you faithfully because they love you and desire to be your disciples in this age and history in which you have placed them as your vessels to finish the mission you started all those years ago on the cross for us. Give us the boldness and the courage to do just that as we carry the gospel to the ends of the world and to the neighbor next door. We ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to take the Lord's Supper.